uh, Chairman Alexander, Ranking Member Murray, and distinguished members of this committee. Thank you uh, for inviting me to discuss Operation Warp Speed and the importance of developing safe and effective vaccines. I'm grateful for your long-standing support of NIH and for this opportunity to address how we are working tirelessly with other parts of the government and with industry partners to prevent, diagnose, and treat the novel coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, let me provide a metaphorical illustration of how vaccines work. Your immune system is like an antibody factory. Yes, you have a very sophisticated biotech company inside your body. When your body sees an invader uh, like these three viruses, it designs an antibody, a Y-shaped protein, that can counter that specific threat. It may take a week or two uh, for the factory to make that new product, but then it keeps the blueprints on file for every antibody it's ever made. The goal of a vaccine, therefore, is to present a completely harmless part of the virus to your body, allowing your factory to work out an effective production strategy. Now, if at some time in the future the actual virus enters your body, your factory can quickly pull out the blueprints and ramp up production, wiping out that virus before it has a chance to multiply and make you sick. For COVID-19, there are six vaccine candidates engaged in large-scale U.S. trials. Each vaccine has already undergone rigorous testing in animals, followed by phase one safety testing in a small group of humans. For three of the six vaccines, we are already in phase three of testing, where the goal is to inject 30,000 volunteers located in areas where the virus is actively spreading. Half of the volunteers are injected with the vaccine and half with a placebo, and nobody knows which is which. Over the next weeks, they are followed closely to see if infections occur. A successful vaccine should have many fewer cases of COVID-19 in those who got the actual vaccine versus those who got the placebo. We will also follow all of them for as long as two years to assess safety. We expect the other three candidates to enter phase three in the coming weeks and months. Now, these six vaccines represent three different scientific approaches. Having this mix of strategies is the best insurance against some unexpected problem with safety or efficacy. We hope and expect that more than one of these will succeed. They all have one thing in common the initiation of immune responses against the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And you've seen this picture so many times, but that's the protein you want to raise that antibody against. We know that people who have survived COVID-19 make neutralizing antibodies to this spike. So we want the vaccine to do the same. Now, the first scientific approach is a very traditional method, recombinant protein technology. Basically, you purify the spike protein in the laboratory and you inject that purified protein and the antibody factory goes to work. The laboratory process to produce and purify the protein means that this approach, although it's tried and true, is on a bit slower trajectory than some of the other candidates, but not much. Novavax plans to initiate their phase three trial in mid-October. Sanofi and GSK announced their phase one clinical trial last week if results are positive, a phase three would start for them by the end of the year. The second scientific approach also uses a well-known vaccine technology, harnessing a harmless viral vector called an adenovirus and using it basically as a delivery truck. The adenovirus is modified by inserting a gene for the spike protein. Once the virus enters the individual cells, the spike protein is produced, triggering an immune response. A phase three clinical trial of this approach was launched by AstraZeneca on August 31st, though it is now, as of yesterday, on clinical hold. And a similar phase three trial will be launched by Janssen later this month. Finally, the newest platform technology is one that was developed at NIH using actually supplemental funds from the Ebola epidemic a few years ago. In this approach, which is now being pursued separately by Pfizer and by Moderna, a small non-infectious snippet of messenger RNA, or mRNA, from the genome of SARS-CoV-2 is prepared. Injecting this mRNA, which codes for this spike protein, into muscle will spur a person's own cells to make that protein and then encourage the production of those protective antibodies against SARS-CoV-2. And before I conclude, I want to address concerns about safety. This is foremost in all our minds. We cannot compromise here. 
The announcement yesterday about the AstraZeneca vaccine is a concrete example of how even a single case of an unexpected illness is sufficient to require a clinical hold for the trial in multiple countries. And that is what's happening. There are ways, however, that we have adopted in warp speed to move quickly while retaining those most rigorous scientific standards. And I think you would want us to do that. People are dying. Delays that traditionally require many years for a vaccine to be developed had to be addressed. In some instances, we have done that by carrying out steps in parallel that are traditionally done in sequence. We've eliminated downtime by moving into new phases before data from the previous phase is completely analyzed. We have, as the chairman said, started to manufacture doses of all these vaccines before we know if they work, understanding that we are spending hundreds of millions of dollars for a vaccine doses that we may have to throw away if they don't work. But please hear me now. The rigor of the scientific evaluation of safety and efficacy will not be compromised. As a scientist, I'm excited that the pace of discovery is allowing us to respond to this crisis in record time. As a physician, I'm hopeful when I think of the millions of lives that have been saved from other diseases through vaccination and the millions more that we can save by developing a safe and effective vaccine for COVID-19.